Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Office of International Programs at the University of Missouri to our webinar today on the war in Ukraine. We are looking forward to a discussion and um, information about the war from diverse lenses, politics, communication, culture, and memory. My name is Mary Stegmeyer. I serve as the Vice Provost for International Programs at the University of Missouri, and I'm also a faculty member in the Truman School of Government and Public Affairs. So before we begin, I'd like to express gratitude to our colleagues and friends in our community who have helped support our Mizzou students who have been impacted by the war. We have been working to connect these students to support resources on campus and in the community. And we are also working to raise emergency funds through our International Student and Scholar Fund to assist them with financial need that's been caused by the war. We plan to have time at the end of this webinar for a few questions. If you would like to submit a question, you can enter it into the chat box. Also, we are recording this, this webinar so that later this week, everyone who is registered will receive an email with a link if they'd like to view the recording. I'm joined today by co-moderator Martha Kelly, Associate Professor of Russian with the MU School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. I'll turn this over to Martha to introduce the speakers. Thank you, Mary. And um, actually, I just wanted to really quickly also acknowledge our um, co-sponsors. National Programs has done much, much of the legwork for this. Um, so thank you, Dr. Stegmeyer. Thank you, Erin. Um, also, um, co-sponsors are School of Literatures, Languages, and Cultures um, here at Mizzou, Peace Studies and International Studies. So I wanted to make sure we acknowledge that. Um, and now I want to tell you a little bit about our panelists. We are so excited and grateful to have these three eminent scholars with us today to shed light on um, these, these uh, very distressing events that are happening in Ukraine and in the larger region. Um, we're going to be started off by Dr. William Reisinger, who is professor of political science at the University of Iowa. Uh, Dr. Reisinger is author of numerous foundational works on politics and the post-Soviet space with a particular focus on democratization and, and elections. He writes about all kinds of other things too, but um, those are just a, a couple of his focus uh, points. Uh, next, he'll be followed by Dr. Haley Cranstuber Horseman, who is an MU scholar. Uh, she's associate professor in the Department of Communications here, but she is currently a Fulbright scholar in Poland at the Polish Institute of Advanced Studies in Warsaw, and her uh, focus of research is family communications. And um, finally, uh, Dr. Yulia Ilchuk will speak with us. She's assistant professor of Slavic studies at Stanford University. Uh, Dr. Ilchuk is a highly interdisciplinary scholar of film, literature, and culture, and she has a special focus on national identity, especially in relationship to cultures of memory. And I also want to just mention here that um, uh, Dr. Ilchuk is originally from the Donbass region in Ukraine, and I'm, uh, we are especially grateful to her for joining us in such a time of tumult and frankly terror for people in places who are beloved to her. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and hand things over to you, Dr. Reisinger. Great, thank you very much. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to, to speak on this panel today. Uh, because I am convinced that Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine has initiated the biggest shift in global affairs since 9-11 uh, and is therefore worth all our close attention. For many years after Vladimir Putin became president of Russia in 2000, he publicly stated Russia's acceptance of Ukrainian in It seems like Bill has frozen. We'll wait just a second. Yeah. Um, I wonder if we should just move ahead and I'll message Bill and um, when and, and Haley, perhaps you can present and then we can have Bill join us when he's reconnected. All right. Do we want to wait for him for a second or go for it? 
Um, that was hard to know what to do. Why don't you go ahead yeah. and I'll okay. send the message. Okay, um, so thank you so much for inviting me to be here uh, today. Uh, my name is Haley Prince Duper Horseman. I'm an associate professor in interpersonal and family communication in at Mizzou, and also I'm at the Polish Institute of Advanced Studies uh, in Warsaw right now on a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the current situation here in Warsaw and my observations, um, reports from the news collected with um, some research on uh, Polish or on uh, refugee families, trauma and resilience. So I want to note before the Ukraine war, Poland was also uh, has become this destination for migrants, particularly outside of the EU. Uh, in the last four years, they have issued more residential permits to immigrants outside of the EU than any other EU member state. Um, so now that we have 1.8 million people crossing uh, into Poland from Ukraine since the 24th of February, um, Warsaw in particular has really hit a saturation point. Um, that's as many people as the entire population of Warsaw has now crossed into Poland, which is considerable. Um, the mayor has reported that uh, about 230,000 people are now staying in the city of 1.7 million, which means about 14 to 15% of the city's population is now a Ukrainian refugee. So according to an ABC News report, about 30% of those refugees uh, from Ukraine are people who have no ties to Warsaw at all. And so because of that, then there's a huge need for support of these refugee families and people. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the assistance efforts and then th some things maybe we should be thinking about uh, and the Polish government is certainly already thinking about in terms of uh, research on refugee families. So there aren't any camps or any uh, large scale housing opportunities at the border. And so because of that, as many of you know, uh, a lot of the refugees are coming via train um, or being shuttled via bus or private car from the border to the bigger cities, Krakow and uh, Warsaw in particular. Uh, and these two cities have warned that they've reached saturation uh, of their ability to accommodate and help those arriving into our cities now. Um, there are signs up at the train station, for example, showing people other places in Poland to go uh, and assuring them that this is a place that is, uh, these are places that are safe to go. So I actually have, I'm going to be talking a bit about the train station because that's the place that I've been, uh, most of my efforts have been going to, uh, to support the Ukrainian refugees. And so I'm going to be showing, I'd like to show some pictures. So this is the central train station, Dvorak Centralne in uh, Warsaw. And these are uh, pictures from the first couple weeks after the Ukrainian invader, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, and so you can see that there is just this massive number of people flooding the train stations. We've seen news reports of it. Um, being there at this time, it oscillated between feelings of panic, feelings of uh, urgency, and then also you can kind of feel in this top picture in particular, this kind of calm before the storm. Uh, I felt that a lot at these train stations where people were just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and queuing in these long lines. Um, in the first few weeks, there was some support from food and drink in, in terms of food and drink, medical care, housing information um, being provided by the city and the government, but very few um, resources were being uh, put toward those efforts. And so most of the burden of uh, providing support was placed on individuals and NGOs in Warsaw. Um, it was really astounding to see the outpouring of love, support, and money uh, toward Ukrainian people, and it continues that way. But the first few days, it was just a tsunami of, uh, of people supporting in any way that they could, to the point where volunteers are now being turned away from the, the train station because there are so many people, uh, and they don't accept clothes anymore, for example, it's just so much support. Uh, until about a week ago, there was very little money uh, from the Polish government being pumped into these efforts. Uh, things have changed, and I'll talk about that as well. But this is a, a really typical scene from the first 
kind of week or two at uh, the train station. This was one of the med, uh, medical areas where they're providing um, supplies to uh, the refugees coming in from the train stations. Uh, this is an appeal from, it's translated, the city is ours uh, NGO, uh, asking for better coordination between institutions and organizations helping refugees in Poland. Another example, I uh, walked around the train station asking different uh, volunteers like what, what is needed, what's, what supplies are needed, how can we raise money. Um, and one person I talked to was at, there's a booth for non-Ukrainian refugees coming from Ukraine. So many of these people are students or uh, other professionals working in Ukraine who don't have Ukrainian citizenship, and they have unique needs. And so I was asking that person, okay, what kind of needs can, can we help with, uh, with these people coming? coming from Ukraine who aren't Ukrainian citizens. And here is one of the brochures she was passing out. Uh, you can see in all different languages that there is, of course, tips for in case of emergency. Here are some hotlines to call. At the bottom here, you can see um, some health information, healthcare information. But what I thought was really interesting and uh, kind of noticeable are the, the two arrows here where she's pointing people to Facebook groups uh, to accommodate their lodging. Um, I thought this was fascinating and uh, really problematic in the long run, but that most of what I saw uh, in those first few weeks especially was that when people needed accommodation, they're going to Facebook, they're going to social media uh, to get individuals to, um, uh, pair up with for uh, uh, showing apartments or extra rooms or uh, whatever that might be. So here's some of the types of uh, posts that you can see on these Facebook groups. And this was just a couple of days ago. Uh, these posts are still coming in very uh, frequently. So refugees are getting on Facebook and posting themselves like in that bottom picture, or they have, there are point people at the border or throughout the city trying to kind of uh, collect these efforts. So, like I said, this was um, a really beautiful and amazing uh, outpouring of support for uh, Ukrainian refugees, but we know that this is not a sustainable way of housing the millions of refugees who are going to come into the country. So moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about what are some better efforts and what are some better things that uh, people, NGOs, the government can do to support refugees based on research about refugee resilience and trauma. So there are some fascinating studies, and this is Sanglong and Vang in 2017 did a meta-analysis about the types of uh, traumas and mental health issues that occur in refugee populations. So refugees are migrating from um, both the before they migrate, during the migration, and then after migration, they have triggers and stressors and traumas along the way uh, that create vulnerabilities for their mental health. Um, and you can see in this quote some of that uh, psychological distress, uh, but we can see problems in terms of greater levels of post-traumatic stress disorder, elevated psychological distress, depression, PTSD, anxiety, ADHD, anxiety disorders, um, but also physical health problems and relational health problems such as attachment problems and trust, uh, interpersonal trust disorders um, that can reverberate throughout generations after uh, the, uh, the refugees have fled. You can see that at the end of this sentence in Sangalong. So based on the research about how to help refugees uh, and resilience in refugee communities, Michael Unger and Kuru in 2021, Unger is one of my very favorite scholars in, in uh, resilience, particularly in refugee population, because he really focuses in on a sociological approach to resilience, meaning that we often talk about resilience as this personal trait or maybe a state, that these people are very resilient. This is very impressive. Um, but in reality, we need to focus more on creating environments that help people to enact resilience uh, after adversity. We need to focus more on providing routine, stable uh, social structures and environments that people uh, can thrive in. And so uh, I wanted to really pin or really point that out and really make that uh, an important part of this discussion that it's important and wonderful to celebrate Ukrainian uh, refugees resilience, uh, but that's not enough. We need to create social structures and healthcare systems and systems in place that 
uh, help them to enact that resilience. So luckily, I've been seeing that in the uh, Polish government so far, I've been seeing um, the Polish government really has been focusing on how to provide structure for Ukrainians who are coming into uh, the, the city uh, and into the country. So for example, again at the train station uh, in the last couple of weeks uh, they've set up tents outside of the train station moved people outside and this seems like a very small change but it makes it a huge difference in terms of uh, the ability for ukrainian uh, refugees to actually access the materials that they need um, to access the information that they need um, that there's a hot food tent it feels uh, really comfortable and lovely inside these hot food tents um, where people are getting hot meals um, you can see in the second picture on the right, uh, this is one of the signs in the train station right now that's talking about trying to get pe people to move out of the bigger cities and into the smaller towns saying uh, big cities are already overcrowded, don't be afraid to go to the smaller towns, they're peaceful, they have good infrastructure, uh, they're ready to take you in. Um, and so this is going to push people into uh, areas that are welcoming and have uh, maybe some more resources to be able to help as well. More importantly, President Duda just signed into law uh, a law to provide support to Ukrainian refugee families and those helping them as well, um, support a one-time effort for the families who are traveling from Ukraine, and then also uh, nine, about $9 a day for those who are housing refugees, which is at least a small token that can help along these efforts. Um, even more important than that though, he's legalizing Ukrainians stay in Poland for 18 months and then after nine months they can apply uh, to stay for a three year temporary resident permit. Um, he's made it, this law has made it easier for people to get a social security number, which is called the PESL here, uh, which allows them to access work and health benefits um, and education. Another uh, small example of things that are going well is that there are cell phone providers set up in the Ukrainian or in the uh, Warsaw Central train station to help people get their cell phone plans work in working order as soon as they get off the trains, which is another one of these examples of ecological support, helping people be able to just uh, live their lives in a normal way by having, having uh, their cell phones uh, accessible. The last thing I want to say is that uh, these Ukrainian children who are coming um, have already been registered at Polish schools for this year and next year, um, and schools need to make sure that they are uh, well funded. Hopefully these will continue to be well funded and these positions, these um, the ability for Ukrainian children to enter into these schools can be uh, supported by the Polish government. So as you can see, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that um, we will continue to see this process of adaptation and hopefully transformation, uh, which is part of Patrice Buzznell's work in resilience. She talks about how we need to first adapt to the stressors and to the trauma, and then we transform from there. And so I'm looking forward to see how Poland uh, transforms based in this situation. Here are, here's one um, site that I've been supporting and um, really repping since um, February called PAH. This is an excellent place to donate if you're looking to do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Horseman. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and move to Dr. Reisinger, who is back with us. Uh, yeah. Uh... Don't know why I uh, got cut off, but happy to be back. Uh, let me start with the question of why did Putin do this? Why initiate a full-scale attack with all its risks? And then when the attack starts to go badly, double down and order attacks on civilian sectors in what seemed clearly to be war crimes. All the official explanations that Russians gave throughout last fall and the beginning of this year were red herrings. None really help us understand uh, what makes this invasion seem sensible. Even Russian foreign policy experts were caught flat-footed when the invasion actually began. They were kind of flabbergasted that Putin chose to take such a risky path. Reliable explanations, I think, will need to wait until memoirs start to appear, and that will be many years from now. Uh, but with that caveat, let me at least describe what I think is kind of a plausible 
set of reasons behind uh, Putin's decision. Uh, Putin believes that the United States and its allies are disrespecting Russia, and by extension himself, because they do not acknowledge what is due to Russia, which is recognition as a great power, which is entitled to a sphere of influence. And Ukraine is the most important country in that sphere of influence. Putin is turning 70 this year, and clearly he's concerned about his legacy. He sees his historical mission as being to ensure Ukraine's loyalty to Russia and separation from the West. He seems to have become in recent years much more emotionally attached to the view that Ukraine was stolen from Russia. Last July, Putin published a manifesto in which he said that Russians and Ukrainians are one people who were artificially divided 100 years ago by the Soviets. He has repeated this argument in his appearances since then. Historians have thoroughly debunked this theory of history, but Putin believes in it, and he believes the US and its Western partners are actively trying to destroy Russia. Another factor is that Putin's circle of advisors has become much more narrow in recent years, especially with the onset of the pandemic. Heightened depression over the last two years has made it so the top elite knows that they must tell the boss what he wants to hear. But in what political scientists call the dictator's dilemma, that also means there is nobody who can play devil's advocate and make sure all the pros and cons have been considered before a big decision is taken. The few close advisors Putin does rely on hold particularly hawkish and anti-Western views. They, like Putin, are eager to undermine the international norms that have been accepted since World War II. Furthermore, prior to the invasion, Putin saw the US and the West more generally as weak and divided, as has-beens in global power terms. He looked at the extent of political polarization in Western countries, the damage the former president did to US relations with NATO allies, last year's hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. And he figured that the response to his invasion would be similar to when he invaded Georgia in 2008 or Ukraine in 2014, that is manageable. Putin calculated that Russia was strong enough to make a bold move to rearrange the global balance of power. He saw Russia's military as significantly more capable than it had been in earlier years due to large scale investment in new equipment and better training over the last decade. He saw the economy as able to withstand new sanctions because of its low debt and large cash reserves. And his regime had put an end to all political opposition and made it too dangerous for all but a few citizens to join protests. As soon as Putin began the invasion, however, events cast doubt on Russia's actual strength as well as on what he saw as Western weakness. The invasion has caused terrible suffering for Ukrainians without achieving a Russian victory. And it has not enhanced Russia's international position, far from it. There's been overwhelming global public opinion against Russia and in support of Ukraine. Swift and coordinated multilateral sanctions from Western countries have gone well beyond any used previously against Russia. Most major international corporations have withdrawn voluntarily from cooperation with Russia and toward uh, and others have stopped dealing with Russian firms. Germany reversed 50 years of its foreign policy uh, toward much larger military investment. Finns and Swedes began showing high levels of support for their neutral countries to join NATO. In Ukraine, which was formerly a politically divided country with ethnic and linguistic differences as a central issue, has seen its citizens of every stripe unite to repel the invader. Hatred of Russia has, has become intense and Ukrainians blame Russia's citizenry for supporting Putin in the war effort. The dense social ties between Ukrainians and Russians, the feeling of being brotherly peoples are gone and probably at least for many generations. All these outcomes are ones that Putin de definitely did not want to see. His choice harmed Russia, weakened Russia's influence around its borders and gave the West, at least for now, new unity. It is important to note, however, that Russia can still conquer Ukraine, and it does have countries of consequence that are supporting it, such as China and India. Much still hangs in the balance. More broadly, all the economic, diplomatic, and security responses to the invasion will have repercussions throughout the global system for years to come. As one example, reducing Europe's use of Russian oil and gas will shift international energy markets and domestic energy consumption and not necessarily in ways that will help us address climate change. So slowly developing trends of recent years have been sped up and in some ways sent in new directions as a result of the invasion. 
In terms of Russia's domestic politics, Putin has responded to the bad news by ratcheting up the repressiveness at home. His government has closed down all independent media, traditional or internet-based, including social media. New draconian laws have been passed, providing for lengthy prison terms for criticizing the government, including by referring to it as an invasion or a war. Putin gave a televised address to his top advisors last Wednesday. In this speech, he went back to the paranoia of the Stalin era, using language like enemies of the people and fifth column. Ironically, Putin had already earned a place in Russian history as the man who had returned Russia to stability and a measure of prosperity after the suffering of the 1990s. With his decision to invade Ukraine, however, he's undermined that image, evidently in search of some even grander legacy. And so what does this all mean for the United States? We need to remember that the strong global denunciations of and sanctions against Russia will be of little value unless they work. That is, unless they help Ukrainians preserve their country's independence while ending the war. People here in the US and elsewhere continue to be impressed by Ukrainians' dedication to defending their country and by their bravery and ingenuity. Their former comedian president has shown himself to be a strong leader, refusing a US offer to be flown to safety with the now famous line, I need ammunition, not a ride. We're all moved by the suffering of Ukrainians being shelled or fleeing their country, as well as by the generous responses from other countries. But here's a warning. Americans must resist the temptation to see all this as just the best ever reality TV show or a new Marvel superhero movie. Instead, this needs to be a time when Americans understand that the stakes are high, that a Russian victory will put America's European allies in jeopardy, that it will heighten, not lessen the danger of an escalation to nuclear war, and it will embolden other countries that want to undermine democracy and rearrange the international order. Because the stakes are high, Americans will need to be willing to sacrifice to ensure that the Russian invasion is thwarted. Gasoline prices have already gone up. There will be shortages of fertilizer and certain key minerals. The price for some kinds of food are likely to increase. In our interdependent global economy, sanctions never work in one way only. Also, we must be willing to welcome our share of the 3 million Ukrainian refugees. Our European allies, as we've just been hearing, are, have been very welcoming, but they cannot do so indefinitely without other countries playing a part. A new refugee crisis in Europe would be doing Putin's work for him. I hope that American leaders will communicate these issues clearly and that America will understand that this is a price worth paying. Fundamentally, Ukraine has been attacked by Russia because Ukrainian society chose to uphold the values that America stands for. Despite all their political and economic problems, Ukrainians have at each key point since the end of the Soviet Union chosen democracy, open borders, and a rule-based international order. While the American response to Putin's aggression to date has been in my view quite good, it cannot stop here. Success will take carefully calibrated policies and a long-term outlook. But our children and grandchildren will not thank us for bequeathing them Vladimir Putin's world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll move to our final panelist, uh, Dr. Ilchuk. Thank you, Marta, Mary, and Erin for organizing. And thank you, everybody, for joining me today. Um, so let me just start this slideshow. Everything is art, everything is politics, said Ai Weiwei, a Chinese contemporary artist, documentarian, and activist who had used his personal experience to create art that fosters empathy to the ongoing refugee crisis around the world. I apologize, I don't know how to turn off the uh, captioning. A Vietnamese-American writer, Viet Nguyen, has become an advocate of displaced residents in the US at a time when dis discourse around refugees has shifted distressingly in the Trump era, with new caps on the refugee settlement being instituted and immigration bans remaining clear policy positions. A Sarajevo native, Yasminko Halilovic, having survived as a child the war in Bosnia, established a World Childhood Museum dedicated to collecting personal testimonies of Bosnian children who lived through the war experiences and presently dispersed across 35 different countries, including Ukraine, with the local branches. 
All these displaced writers and artists combine political conviction and individual creativity towards genuine humanistic concern for all who lost their home and seeking for a new sense of belonging. Unlike displaced people in most of the countries across the world, Ukraine has been witnessing two refugee crises during the last two years. First wave of the internally displaced persons from East Ukraine in 2014, and second mass wave of both internally and externally displaced people as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As of today, every fourth citizen of Ukraine has left their home due to the war. In my book, Project on Memory, Culture of the Displaced and Vanished One, I examine the relationship between forced displacement, memory, and identity. Places do not remember, move, or create identities, people do. Hence, displacement, memory, and identity are the embodied experiences, which are remembered, reconstructed, and enacted in a new environment, creating an in-between space of, I'm here now, but only here temporarily until I can go back. In my talk today, I want to summarize some of the idiosyncrasies of the displaced memory and survey the major trend, trend in uh, what I call refugee literature and art. Traditionally, memory has been regarded as a social phenomenon. When we remember, we always compare our interpretation of the past with interpretations of the others, and thus social identities and bonds are formed. It could be said that the very essence of identity depends on the shared memory. But once a person is removed from the mnemonic community, they lose previous identity and have to negotiate a new identity in a new place. Therefore, displaced memory still can sustain the self, but at the same time, it depends only on the self, emanating from the self in, and simultaneously upholding the self. The inner working of the memory and cultural strategies of coping with the displacedness need to be analyzed as efforts of maintaining the self outside of one's original community. In stable mnemonic communities, the process of social memory follows what neurobiologists uh, call the pattern completion. Out of the multiple versions of the past, social memory arbitrarily select past events and rearrange them into distinctive cultural patterns so that through reading process and interpretation, they accord these timeless values and beliefs. Creative works by displaced artists, however, deals with massive forms of human existence and mental states during the war, thus providing an alternative way of thinking of memory. The reality of the migration crisis as a result of Russian-Ukraine war presents new challenges to the scholars to conceptualize memory and culture. In the works by and about displaced persons, the emphasis is made on the power of creative writing, storytelling, and performance that reveal an unstable nature of memory in which the border between remembering and forgetting is formed like a tide mark. It challenges our perception of the physical border as a line, as well as memory in terms of their position between remembering and forgetting. Signifying memory's instability and non-linearity, tide marks capture traces of movement, which can be repetitive or suddenly change, may generate long-term cultural effects or disappear fast, but nevertheless continue to mark the difference. Memory of the internally displaced persons and refugees has been studied in trauma studies with a focus on the negative effect of memory loss and temporal and spatial dislocation. All migrant communities are dismembered in the sense that they cease to be part of their older community and cannot easily integrate into new ones. Dismemberment, erasure of memory, spatial dislocation, and temporal discontinuity find their poetic and artistic realization uh, in the works of Ukrainian displaced writers. Dismemberment figures as a central metaphor in Apricots of Donbass by Lyubov Yakomchuk, the native of Pervomaisk Luhansk region, since 2014 controlled by self-proclaimed Lugansk People's Republic. In the preface to the volume of poetry, Kimchuk addresses the ethical challenges of making art out of violence. The poem, Disintegration, captures the massive destruction of her hometown during the summer of 2014. As Pervomaisk was bombed out into Perva and Maisk, the entire life and art became fragmented into a kaleidoscope of disjoint images. Wonderfully Illustrated poems of apricots of Donbass resemble the futurist experiment typography that aimed to make the materiality of a word visible. 
In Yakimchuk's case, the expressive disintegration of the word and image at once resists poetization and yet seems remarkably generative of it. This tension between poetic language and lived individual experience constitutes a major focus of her poetry. Although disintegration is a late motif of the cycle, it also evokes anticipation of the birth of something new and pure, like the blossom of apricot trees on the waste banks of the bus. The next displaced poet from Donetsk Ia Kiva employs sewing as a central metaphor, signifying the search for new identity and language by displaced writer who faces dual challenges, spatial dislocation and loss of audience. Ia Kiva, who until 2019 wrote all her poetry in Russian, after moving to Kiev in 2014, became an active translator of the contemporary Ukrainian poetry into Russian and finally found her Ukrainian voice in the first collection of Ukrainian poetry, first page of Winter. The spatial displacement in Kiva's poetic world is accompanied with a temporal desertion and disjointedness. It creates a possibility of juxtaposing individual trauma of the present day war with a post memory of Kiva Jewish family relocated during the collectivization to Donbass. The voice of a poet as a witness of the war is the voice of a biblical prophet. Um, an award-winning writer from Donetsk, Volodymyr Rafinka, wrote most of his prose fiction in Russian and until the outbreak of the war in 2014 enjoyed more popularity in the Russian Federation than in Ukraine. In July 2014, like Ia Kiva and Lyubov Kimchuk, he had to leave his hometown and moved near to Kyiv. As an eyewitness to the first months of the war, Rafinka captured his experience in two novels, The Lantitude of the Days, published in Russian in 2017, and Monday Green in Ukrainian, published, recent translation was published uh, last month. Um, he used a complex artistic approach to memory by transporting his protagonist into the realm of fantasy, dreams, and phantasmagoria. In his narrative art and poetics, fantasy and memory exist in symbiosis as a part and parcel of human apprehension. In visual and performing arts, we witness similar processes of restoration of memory and remembrance, which counter disintegration, displacement, and dismemberment. In the artistic efforts to resemble broken lives into something workable in the future, a community of displaced artists comes together in a forced migration despite the odds. The artistic activities of Izolatia, a displaced art institution from Donetsk, which found a new home in Kyiv, and of the theater of the internally displaced people create a shared communication space between the IDPs and the rest of Ukrainians. The 2016 exhibition, The Restoration of Memory, organized by the displaced artists from Crimea and Donbass, shows how the effect of the forced resettlement reaches beyond the material losses. It entails the loss of personal memories. Cut off from their roots, deprived of the past and certain about their future, lacking support in the present, the Ukrainian IDPs cannot move forward until this loss is apprehended, described and analyzed, and until this emptiness caused by it is filled with something else. Each of the 12 displaced artists in the exhibition captured their own personal losses, using all available artistic media to analyze the possibility of reconstructing their own memory. For example, Sergei Zaharov reconstructed his own department in Donetsk as he left it in July 2014. Zaharov's installation creates the unsettled and unsightly interior of a typical Khrushchev dwelling, a floor lamp, a shabby Soviet armchair, a flower pot on the windsill, socks on the radiator, and the view outside the window, a dull place from which everyone living in the provinces wanted to escape at least. The next object, curtain by Yulia Palunina Boot, is made from the artist's family photographs and represents a poor and tasteless design of the doorways of Soviet apartments. In this way, she restored a fragment of her past that once annoyed her, but now has become a symbol of displacement. A curator of the exhibition, Adrie Dostlev, resembles his, forget resembles his forgotten at home family album by altering the stranger's photos which he bought at the flea market. By creating a sort of visual palimpsest and crossing out stranger's memory, this fills the gaps of his own lost memory. Almost the same technique of substitution and appropriation was used by a co-curator of the exhibition, Leah Dostleva, only she chose not to destroy someone else's memory, but to copy and depersonalize it. 
The next artist, Maria Kulikovska, and her typical Lubok style buried the memory places of her carefree childhood in Crimea by framing her family photographs with a black mourning frame. And in order to enhance the message of her artistic objects, she printed them on the metal ceramics, remember, mourn, love, just like they appear on the gravestones. All the exhibits at the reconstruction of memory are united by the same memory work when a person begins to feel nostalgia for something that previously irritated uh, them or caused discomfort, but after displacement acquired a new significance. The theater of internally displaced persons was established in 2015 by the Ukrainian playwright Natalia Varashbit, psychoanalyst Alexei Karachinsky and the German theater director George Gino. The theater of IDPs has become a platform where personal and public spaces and private memories and collective memories are confronted for grounding unpredictability and forgetting as drivers of the subject perception of its action. Doku theater can perform various kinds of memory, but when docu drama performs the past, its representation becomes part of a collective memory of the war, pressing historical and ethical obligations on all facets of the work of performing the past. Put on stage, the performance of memory draws our attention to space and setting within which we see the reciprocal legibility of setting and action. The shared setting between audience and performers becomes the means of making the dramatic past a shared present. The theater of IDP tests the concept of theater as a last refuge in flight from death. So some of the projects that I uh, mentioned on the slide uh, uh, examine, uh, for example, a, a new idea, what is, uh, where is West, uh, where is East, which puts on stage the refugees from Donbass and Crimea who have moved to Lviv and had to deal with the problems of ethnic othering. Many of the participants have remained with the theater forming the community that has grown to several dozen people. Since 2015, the theater of internally displaced expanded its activity by establishing the Institute of Modern Drama, a playwriting center and laboratory for documentary theater making, and by involving participants from other regional centers. During five years of its activity, the theater evolved from a niche experiment for an narrow audience to a live open theater where everyone can share the refugee experience. The goal of the theater is to put on stage all now 10 million IDPs uh, from Ukraine. To conclude, there is obviously a clear political aspect in having a strong tradition of refugee literature in a national state like Ukraine. While the identity forming capacity of the thriving historical prose fiction in Ukraine support the assumption that memory of a nation must be homogeneous, literature, visual arts, and performances about the ongoing war in Ukraine challenges an ethnically centered approach to memory and identity and shifts attention to the memory of traumatized subjects, displaced memory, memory on the move, and creates a plurality of memory cultures in Ukraine. Displacement, loss, the need to reinvent oneself as a subject, all these aspects of the refugee's experience enable us to think of memory as a non-causal dynamic negotiation between the lived experience of a displaced individual and the collective discourse of memory of the past. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia and uh, Bill and Haley for your excellent presentations. It'll give us a lot to discuss. Um, if you do have, for the audience, if you do have questions, we've had a few questions come in that we'll move to in a moment, but you're welcome to put your questions in the chat. Um, but before we move to the Q&A, um, I'd like to uh, have, uh, we'll show a slide that has some of the, um, uh, funds that people can consider donating to if you would like to help. Um, you'll see that the first fund we have up here is the MU International Student and Scholar Fund. Um, it looks like it just disappeared, but um, in any case, I will tell you about it. The International Student and Scholar Fund is an emergency fund that we use to help support um, international students and scholars who are experiencing emergencies at home that are impacting um, their financial situation here on campus. So that is one way that you can help. Um, we are working currently with our students who have been impacted by the war, um, in some cases, 
Some of the students have been relying on family members for some of their financial support. And suddenly, if family members um, are refugees, they are no longer working, and the students then are experiencing financial need. Um, Martha will cover some of these other sources um, that we have compiled or that we're familiar with as well. So just quickly, um, uh, you'll find the USAID site listed here useful because there's a fact sheet about what's going on and also kind of a long list of charities. These are reliable charities. Um, I want to uh, especially direct your attention to this third um, link here, the Ukrainian Association of Washington State. And this is, uh, the association has existed for some time, but um, a number of uh, Fulbright scholars who are in the U.S. who are from Ukraine have come together to create some fundraising opportunities through this organization. And this is a link to donate. And I just want to say that you can actually choose where your money goes. So it can go to medical supplies, to uh, body armor for the civilian territorial defense or to um, helping fund and support inter internally displaced families and orphans. Um, and, and that this was brought to our attention by one of our own graduate students here at MU who's uh, in, in the J school. Um, another uh, great organization to um, give money to right now is Razom for Ukraine, which means uh, together. Um, for Ukraine. And this is an organization that was started in 2014 after the invasion of Crimea um, and is especially supported by the Ukrainian diaspora. Um, right now, they're, they're um, putting a lot of their resources towards medical supplies and other kinds of humanitarian support. So that's a great organization to give to. Um, Stand with Ukraine uh, and Real Ways You Can Help Ukraine as a Foreigner. These are both sites that, that list um, a number of ways, not just donating to reliable charities, um, trustworthy charities, but also other kinds of ways that you can get involved and help. So I really encourage you to, to look at these. I also just want to mention, I'll put this in the chat, um, Penn Ukraine. Penn is an association, international association for writers. And um, the, the Ukraine specific chapter of Penn is um, raising funds to help displaced writers. Um, so again, I'll get that in the chat. These are all great things to um, support. Thank you, Martha, for that, that overview of these uh, charitable organizations. So let's turn to the Q&A. We've gotten a number of excellent questions from the audience. Um, so Bill, I'm going to ask the first question of you. So I'm going to combine two questions. One person asked if you could uh, tell us all what you do again. But um, then also the question is, are countries such as China and India supporting Russia, Russia or are they just turning a blind eye? And how does this impact the world view on, on them, meaning I think China and India? Sure, thanks. Um, I uh, teach at the University of Iowa in the political science department. I specialize in comparative politics and um, uh, in particular, I have been focusing on countries of the former Soviet Union. Uh, I first went to Moscow in 1983-84 uh, for dissertation research and have been back about 18 or 19 times since then and various things. And, and uh, so I, I've really have a lot of familiarity with Russia. I've been to Ukraine a half dozen times uh, and some of the other countries in the region. Um, uh, in terms of the other um, of the countries uh, such as China and India, they are trying to be kind of quiet about their support for Russia. They're not coming out and uh, actively voicing opposition uh, to Russia, uh, but nor are they um, taking direct stands of support for Russia, which has been the case for uh, some some other countries, you know, Syria, Eritrea, and, and a few others like that. So these we're talking about uh, for China and India. We're talking about countries that uh, just simply abstained when the United Nations voted to condemn Russia's invasion. Um, China is uh, has very close ties with Russia, and they've been deepening their ties over the last decade. And and uh, China is very eager to receive Russian energy exports. In particular, they they become closer militarily and they're exchanging technology and, and some joint military activities. They do not have an alliance. They're not quite uh, that closely tied, but China uh, shares with Russia um, 
dissatisfaction with the international status quo. Uh, they, they share with uh, Russia a uh, dislike of efforts to promote democracy in countries around the world. And, and so in many ways, they're simpatico on the world stage. And so China is going to help Russia in part by giving them an outlet for exports that and trade that are are going to be lost with Western countries. Uh, India has stepped up its purchasing of Russian energy and military equipment, which is also a help to Russia's economy under sanctions. So uh, those are some of the ways in which those countries, while not being super vocal about it, are definitely helping Russia. Thank you. Um, I have a wonderful question here in the chat that I think you know all, all three of you might want to weigh in on. Um, I'll read the whole thing. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and for your presentations. I live in rural Missouri. Numerous people here are vocalizing indifference or even anti-Ukraine sentiments. Some are even saying that they trust Putin more than our own government. How can people's eyes be open to reality, to the suffering in Ukraine and the impacts to the entire world in times of continued severe political divide in the US that we can't seem to get past? I, you know, that's not my area of expertise. Um, so, you know, I, I say this uh, very modestly, but I, th I think in the short to medium run, it has to start with messaging from political and cultural elites in the country. And so that means uh, the, the, we have to see how the struggle within the Republican Party goes, right? Because some Republicans have reacted uh, with very strong condemnation of Russia. Uh, and support for Ukraine, uh, but others, as the questioner noted, uh, have been uh, kind of pro-Putin and remain that way, outspokenly, uh, you know, through the media and uh, on the campaign trail. So uh, that's a struggle, I think, within the Republican Party that we don't know how it's going to to end. Uh, I think that the, the uh, leaders of the Democratic Party also need to step up their messaging about this and the importance. Uh, we know that. Um, the conflict in Europe uh, has to eventually involve the United States. And, uh, you know, twice in the last century, the United States had to send its armies to Europe uh, to fight uh, aggressive powers. And uh, certainly that's a big fear out of this as well. And it, you know, all Americans uh, have to take that seriously. Uh, and we have to figure out a good policy in the nuclear age. But uh, I think, um, you know, what I was trying to stress is that it has to be a combination of uh, sanctions along with just other kinds of positive, or I'm sorry, I don't mean to say sanctions. I mean, it has to be a, a combination of sacrifices on the part of American people with things we do positively for the Ukrainians. Uh, that is going to, you know, have to be our policy if, in, in the long run. Thank you. So the next question is for Haley. So how are governments such as in Poland um, working to prevent human trafficking? So the abduction of children or young people and trafficking them for terrible purposes. Uh, that was a, a very insightful question, very serious question. Um, this is not something that I study or have expertise in, but um, I do know that UNICEF has called for more blue dot um, areas. Uh, and these blue dot areas are places that um, women or and children in particular can go and that they know are safe and um, are uh, secure places that they can get food and water and shelter and not uh, be subject to any sort of trafficking. Um, and this is a, such an insightful question because um, human trafficking is much more prevalent uh, during times of war and crisis, and particularly with this uh, with this war, uh, there's women and children being displaced, uh, like we've been talking about by the millions. And so the, the one program I do know about is that UNICEF has been calling for more of the blue dot um, centers, these places that women and children can go that they know are safe, uh, so they don't have to trust just anyone off the streets. So I'll um, put, oh, I don't think, can I put this into the chat? Yes. Um, here's a little bit more information about the blue dot programs from ports. Uh, from last week. Thank you. Um, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, 
I, um, <clears throat> let's see, I'll, I'll just read one of them here. Compared to the efforts made by European countries, for instance, Poland and Romania, is it disrespectful for Americans to be complaining about their sacrifice of inflated gas prices? Yeah, I don't know about disrespectful. It, um, it certainly, uh, I think, is something that we ought to put into a perspective, right? And uh, we, we tend to use gasoline prices uh, to, uh, you know, as a sort of indicator of all things good or bad uh, with, with the political system here in the country. And, uh, you know, that's, we need to disassociate that a little bit from, from I think, what is going on internationally. And also keep in mind that higher gas prices affect people in different ways in the United States, that uh, there are people who are more um, vulnerable to uh, having to deal with higher gas prices and, uh, and um, that's something to keep in mind as well. Maybe we have time for one more question. Um, and this comes back to the questions around refugees. So should we as Americans be, um, anticipating an influx of Ukrainian refugees and um, how will this be funded or supported? So we've just had an influx of Afghan refugees in the United States um, and more are hopefully coming to the US, but this is also happening at a time where housing prices are going up and there's shortages of housing. Um, so what can be done to, if we expect that Ukrainian refugees will be coming to the US, what might the US do to prepare? Maybe Haley, I'll turn this to you or Yulia, please go yeah, ahead. Um, as I know, because I follow closely one of the immigre um, attorney uh, here in California, uh, there is no special program for refugee uh, to come to the US. They can only enter as tourists and the line in Warsaw to get a visa, tourist visa is like a two, three years uh, of wait time. Uh, the only program that currently was announced is Scholar at Risk and uh, all universities trying to put together uh, temporary visiting positions for those scholars, but they are they are highly educated and uh, um, mark you know people who uh, will only diversify the uh, environment here. So I, I don't think a refugee crisis is an immediate danger for the U.S. Great. Well, it's time for us to wrap up. So I want to say thank you to the panelists for participating and sharing their experiences and expertise with all of us. And also thank you to all of you who attended. We had great attendance today. I saw numbers that were above 300. So that's fantastic that our community is interested and cares about um, the war that is happening in Ukraine. A recording will be posted on the International Program's website and all of you who have registered for this um, webinar will receive an email later this week with the link to um, the recording. So thank you very much and I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, goodbye. <laughs>